The vision received was that of blood cells traveling throughout the body supplying the much needed oxygen and other nutrients to the differing members of the body to fulfill their purpose. Once the blood cells are spent, they must return back to the heart to be refilled before being sent out again and fulfill their purpose. Welcome everyone. Good evening. It's good to have you back. That we may finish and conclude our lesson on the resurrection of the dead, which is part of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Um, we're going to start with reading those principles again in Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through 3. Uh, Deborah, if I can ask you to start reading that, verse 1, John 2, and then Monica 3, and we will go on from there. This will be the conclusion of I call it an addendum, just an additional kind of summary of everything we've gone through and maybe add a few things here and there. Hebrews what? Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. That's right. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you a moment to think about it. If you could say that Jesus had a weakness, what would you say it was? Us. Hmm. I'll ask you to clarify in a second. If, Jesus had a if you could say that Jesus had a weakness, what would you say it was? I can't. Well, I mean, other than the fact that he was human, of flesh and blood. Okay. Oh no, <laughs> that was hard. Like, <laughs> because we don't think of him. Well, I don't know. No, you're right. You don't yeah, think of him as, as weak. He's just complaining. Right. Because for me, Jesus. Right. He got all his strength from God. Like he was always praying, praying, mm -hmm. praying for like everything. So he had that it, relationship, like that close. Mm -hmm. Relation with the Father, so he was always praying. So I would think of him as having a weakness. As okay. long as he was in tune with God. That's an answer. Do you have one? I would just answer I think that we. I think I we are his answer. weakness. Okay. Deborah? I have no clue. I like the answer, so. Well, that's nice. So can you clarify your answer? What do you mean by we are his weakness? Well, he, he made this in his image, and he wants us to be like him, but as, because we're, we're so flawed. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and he constantly having to look after us and pray for us. And if I was on a battlefield, that would be the weakness, because if I knew if I went after his people, mm -hmm. that's uh, his weakness. But everything else he's strong at, except for his people. Us. We're so flawed that he's always having to, to look out for us. You know, put things in our path that would help us go the right direction. But mm -hmm. we're, sometimes we're too stupid or ignorant to even notice that. Man, that's harsh. Maybe not. But they're too but stupid and ignorant. No, which is true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. We are. It's blunt. It is. Well, okay. It is. We, it is. Uh, but we are. Well, I mean, like, from, well, from, well, that's from infants to adults. I mean, because sometimes mm -hmm. as adults, we I make those that, same <laughs> stupid mistakes over and over again. Mm -hmm. Or even if you know it's wrong, you still do it. Mm. Like, wow, I can, I can get away with this this time. But yeah. no, you can't. Yeah. But then, but then <laughs> I, I agree with you. I think that is, and I do believe that the enemy goes after his people because that's... <clears throat> What, what he can get at, the weaker ones. But I also think that um, from a 
perspective of a teacher, like sometimes the student that I want to build up the most is my weakest student, like the one that mm -hmm. has no chance, seemingly, at the beginning. It's like, oh gosh, you know. And sometimes you're like, oh gosh. But when you work with that student and they get stronger, and then they become, they overcome the obstacles that made them a weak student, there is great pleasure in that. So I think the Lord feels that way about us in seeing our flaws and our stupidity at times and our yeah. stubbornness and our resistance to all the things that he has for us because we're, sh I was talking to my kids about this, we're short-sighted. We can't see what he sees, but he sees what we need. And I think that when mm -hmm. we get it, finally, <laughs> after a lot of try, um, well, it's yeah. a great joy to him. So while we are his weakness, but we can also have a source of joy. It's a great pleasure, absolutely. Okay. You can be his weakness, and mm -hmm. you can show him strong. It's the other side of a coin, you know, weakness and pleasure. <laughs> okay. Keep those answers in your mind. Uh, I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong. They're not where I'm taking you, though. And that's <laughs> fine. That's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I want you to consider a couple scriptures as we read them. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 26. Ralph, you will go ahead and read that one. 26. I'll give you the verse in a second. Uh, 41, sorry, 41. And then, Patricia, get ready to read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. So for those of you that are jotting it down so that you have the scriptures and read them on their own, it's Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, which Brother Ralph will read. And then we will read Hebrews 4, 15 shortly thereafter. By Patricia. Hebrews 4, 15. Uh, Ralph, when are you ready? 26.41 Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus spoke that to his disciples. I'll, I'll be in a second. I know, you don't have to read that. Um, he said to them, hey, you guys need to watch. You need to pray. This was, I believe, at the Garden of Gethsemane. This was right before he was going to get crucified. He wanted them to stay up because they were falling asleep. He says, watch and pray. Get alert. So that you don't fall into temptation. Because the Spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. <clears throat> now obviously he was talking to them. He was referring to them. But if you want to know anything about the night of, of that, that, after that last supper, um, and how they went to pray in the garden, uh, and you know the travail and the great burden that he was under, uh, where he was praying to the Lord and all the disciples had just fallen asleep and he was basically utterly alone. Even his, you know, his tight knit disciples, Peter, James, and John, uh, Peter, James, and John, they all fell asleep, and he was alone, and he was burdened because he knew what was about to take place. He understood <clears throat> that everything that he knew was supposed to come to pass was right there, about to come to pass, and that meant his death. And so he's telling the disciples. So. I want you to consider some scriptures that Patricia is about to read. Jesus' flesh was just like ours in every way. So let's read those scriptures that say that. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Could you read that again about in all points? For 
we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In all points, in every way that we are tempted to sin, Jesus was also tempted to sin. He sweated like us. He hungered like us. He thirsted like us. His body had daily needs, just as our body has daily needs. In all points, he was tempted. It says in Philippians, and and I'll go ahead and read that, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, He made himself of no reputation, talking about God. God made himself of no reputation, Well, I I should go back further because I want you to understand the connection. Um, It's talking about God, but it's it's talking about Jesus Christ. It says, let this mind, the mind of God, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, Jesus Christ was in the form of God, but he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. It says he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of what? Men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So here we have Sister Patricia reading that in all points he was tempted like we are. We look at Philippians and we say, wow, God made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of of what, what, what would be considered a servant, considering who God is, made himself just like a common man. He was made in the likeness of men and found fashioned as a man. So considering all of that, if we, if, if I guess, I guess since I'm the one teaching, I say, if I could say that Jesus had a weakness in any area, it was his flesh. But his spirit was always willing. His spirit was always willing to do the will of God. And so he never sinned. The spirit of God in him was what made him strong. The Spirit enabled him to overcome the temptations that his flesh experienced. It enabled him to never sin because he walked completely and totally dependent upon the Spirit of God to do what God wanted him to do. So I bring this back to the scripture that we I think we read uh, last time. We talked about a seed and dying. Deborah, could you read John chapter 12, verse 24? John chapter 12, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. And if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now Jesus, maybe what the disciples did not understand was that he was talking about himself. The verse prior to what uh, Deborah just read was, Jesus said, The hour is come, the Son of Man, that the Son of Man should be glorified. One of the things that I've said before is that we can't do anything for God until we die first. 
And what I meant was that we die to our own will. We die to our own self, our, our, our uh, desires, our own passions. We, that, that needs to be put to death. In other words, it needs to be denied. We have to deny our flesh in order to walk in the Spirit. It has to go under so that we can be born again in the Spirit to do that which God wants us to, to do that which He enables us to do by His Spirit. John, if you will read, as we consider these scriptures, Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So right here we see, and we've said this before, the law was perfect. It was holy. There is nothing wrong with the law. But who was the law given for? Humans. Sinners, lawbreakers, not just humans. Because Adam and Eve were human. They didn't have the law. The reason why he eventually brought forth the law is because they refused to acknowledge their sin. So they had to be shown that they were lawbreakers by giving them all of these commandments to follow and to show them, see, you messed up. See here, you messed up. See, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. You are deserving and worthy of death. But the law, even though it was perfect, could not justify man. It doesn't do that. It just tells man you're guilty. So the problem isn't the law. The problem is the flesh. The flesh is incapable of fulfilling the perfect law. In Romans chapter 7, verse 17 and 18, I want you to see what the problem is. It's, it's not just the flesh. There's something that is contaminated in the flesh. And I believe Romans chapter 7, verse 17 and 18, reveals that to us. The flesh is contaminated with something. So, Sister Monica, if you read 17 and 18. Now then, it is more... Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. That is every man's struggle. Every human struggle. I struggle to do that which is good. And when I struggle to do that which is good, then I'm admitting that the law is good. Because I'm struggling to do it. I know that it's good. But I, I just, Paul is saying, I have this struggle that, that I will to do it. I want to do it. I, I desire it. But what did he say? Is contaminated in his flesh. Sin dwells in me. Now he, he clarified it, not to say that sin is in my spirit. No, he said specifically, for I know that in me, that is, let me clarify, in my flesh. My flesh is contaminated with sin. And that's why I need to deny it. I need to put it to death. I need to not walk in it. I need to not satisfy its lust or satisfy its appetites. And when you look at the life of Jesus, that's exactly what he showed us. He refused to walk in a way that was just to please himself. Remember when the disciples left him at the well? What did they go for? They went to go get food. And yet, it's not like he was there so hungry. No, 
What was he there? He was ministering to to the Samaritan woman. And when the disciples came back, did anybody feed this guy? He said, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. That's what nourished him. That's what satisfied him. That's what gave him sustenance. That's what um, maintained him. Does that mean he never ate? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he was so in line with God in denying his flesh that it was doing the will of God that nourished him, that strengthened him because he lived the life in the flesh just like we all do. So it says here the problem is that sin is in the flesh. But the good news is that God dealt with that. He sent his own son, himself, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Notice I said in the likeness of sinful flesh. So that all the sins of the world can be put on him. So that he would pay the penalty for every person in the world. Because every person in the world, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He died for the sins of the whole world. Not just the church. Not just the ecclesia. He died for those that would reject him anyway. Sin was, imp- you remember how we talked about the laying on of hands? And how we laid hands on the goat or we laid hands on the bullock and what was being imparted? The sins of the people. Well, in that same sense, God being the, Jesus being the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, from before anything happened, he was already slain. All of the sins of all of, uh, of the people that he created that fell were put upon him. And in, unto him was imparted the sin. And then sin was condemned in the body of his flesh on the cross. Where do I read that? I read that in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For it says, for what the law could not do, again, the law couldn't do it. The law couldn't bring about perfection in man. It says, in that it was weak through the flesh, It's the flesh that was weak. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. God had to do something with sin because the law only decreed that the penalty of that sin was death. The law didn't rectify it. The law didn't cleanse anybody. Jesus Christ had to pay the penalty in the body of his death. So let's read some more scriptures to consider. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read six verses, one at a time. I think it's Monica? No, it's Ralph. Oh, it's Ralph? Okay, so Ralph, we'll just go around. We're doing one verse at a time. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1 through 6. And you said reading two verses at a time? One, one verse at a time. And you have he quickened who were dead in the trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So it says here, You, he quickened. Quickened means make alive. Made alive. You, he made alive. You who were dead in the trespasses of your sins, he made alive. Because in the times past, you walked according to the spirit of this world. You walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in all the children of disobedience in the world. That's how you were, but he made you alive. Speaking to the Ephesian church. He made you alive. And then he said, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I mean, he, he just fully blanketing us in, we were lost, we were dead, we were in our trespasses, we were in our sins, we walked according to our desires and the lust of what? The flesh. Again, it's contaminated. The sin in the flesh is, it, it, is, is the problem, not the law. Deborah, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, it's quickened us together by, or with Christ, by grace you are saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I love how verse 4 starts. I mean, Paul's just laying it out. You were dead, you were, you, you were disgusting, you were, you were in your trespasses, in your sins, and then he says two words. But God. Oh, but God. God did something mighty and marvelous. God did a miracle. God did a wondrous work because of his rich in mercy toward us, because of his great love for us. Even while we were dead in our sins, he quickened us together with Christ. And then it says, by grace ye are saved. By the Spirit of God, the divine empowerment of God, you are made alive even though you are still in that contaminated flesh. He still made you alive. And he raised you up together. He made you to sit together in heavenly places with him. We have to realize that before we came to God, we were dead. Spiritually, we were dead. In the eyes of God, we were considered dead. Why? Because we were separated from him. Adam and Eve we're given a decree. The day you eat of that tree, what? You shall what? Surely die. die. Did they die immediately? No. no, but what did die? I wouldn't even so much say that. Their relationship, Their relationship with God died right there that day. The intimacy that they had with him, the closeness, the transparency, everything that made Walking with God marvelous was dead from that point. Because at that point that they sinned, what did they start doing? Hiding from God, clothing themselves. When he was out calling out their name, they were shh, shh, quiet, quiet, quiet. They didn't want anything to do with him. Why? The relationship had been marred. It had been infected. And what was there? Sin. There was not sin there before. There was not sin in their flesh before. But when they sinned, they immediately became contaminated and could not walk together with the holy God like they used to. And in that sense, they died. Their relationship died. Now, did that culminate in another death later on? Yeah, they eventually physically died. So his word is true no matter how you look at it. But what I'm trying to say is that your relationship died the moment you sinned. And that's what was that's why you were considered dead in his eyes because you were separated from God. We did not live according to the spirit. And we could not even if we tried our very best. Our intimacy, our communion with him was non-existent. It was dead. And that's how the world is walking right now. They have no relationship with God. And the sad thing is that some of them have no relationship with God, yet they're deceived and they believe that they actually are. And they do have a relationship with God. So what happens when we get baptized? I'm trying to bring in all of the principles to, together. Well, we've said this before. Our old man, our old life, that factory of sin that does nothing but produce sin because it's just contaminated, infected with sin, it dies. It's put to death. Paul said, you were dead. 
But he also said, we have been quickened. We've been made alive, even though we're in this contaminated, mortal body. We have been raised up. We have been made alive in him. Even though we were dead in our mortal body, separated from the Lord. So Paul, he wrote in the letters and he received this revelation that Christ was now living in him. I don't think anybody else understood what that born again experience meant until Paul started writing it out and sort of making it concrete because that was the revelation. It is the only reason that he could speak and do all the things that he did because he had been quickened together with Christ. And he, his life was solely for him. So while we were dead, we were walking according to the world. And in God's eyes, we are dead if we are in, in, out of relationship with him. And if we're out of relationship with God, then we must be in relationship with somebody else. We're in relationship with his enemy, his adversary. We were serving Satan. So to be spiritually dead is to do according to the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. That's what it is to be dead when you're walking in that spirit that's walking in the spirit of rebellion and disobedience. It's not talking about physical death, but a spiritual death. So kind of what you said earlier, there's a spiritual death. And the spiritual death is because <clears throat> when you are separated from the only being that can ever give you life, God, then yeah, in a sense, you're spiritually dead. Because God is eternal life. Separate and apart from him, well, then we're walking as dead men and we're serving a lying spirit, and we don't have eternal life. So we've got to understand, at some point in our lives, we've got to come to terms with the fact that, yeah, before I was born again, I was dead in my trespasses, in my sins, and I was a sinner. Christ died for us so that we would have not just abundant life, but abundant life in Him. The whole purpose of being born again is to reestablish that communion, that communication, to reestablish the fellowship, to reestablish the intimacy that we had lost in the Garden of Eden. Now, we might have walked in the Garden of Eden, but we didn't have that relationship with God like Adam and Eve had before they fell. So when that takes place, then we can serve God. When we reestablish, or when our relationship with Him is reestablished, because we didn't really reestablish it, He did it for us. When we have a relationship with God in Christ Jesus, then we are made alive spiritually to be able to hear Him like we've never heard before, to be able to be led by Him like we've never been led by Him before. So He has, past tense, Raised us up. Present tense. He's already done it. Together with him. And made us to sit together in heavenly places with him on his throne. Now obviously none of us see that. Not naturally. But if God decreed it in his word. Then we've got to let the word renew our minds to that fact. So when we look at the circumstances of our life and the different difficulties and obstacles and the things that cause us depression or disappointment or worry or anxiety, we've got to get our eyes off of that and remember, what did God decree about my situation? I was dead, but I'm no longer dead. I'm made alive with him. And he has seated me together with him on his throne. And where is he seated? High above all principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and wicked spirits in high places. But he said, I'm seated together with him. Then I must be also seated high above all principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places. That's the truth. 
It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I feel. What matters is what God has already decreed and declared. That's the only thing that's true. So we need to ask God to give us a revelation of this so that we can walk in it. Because when the storms and the violent winds come our way, we can walk through it like we're walking through the eye of the storm. He says in the Psalms, he says it in a different way, he didn't say it this way, but he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, I'm, I'm in there. I'm in that darkness. I'm walking in this valley, which is a low place. And there's shadows. And when we look at shadows, there's darkness because there was light somewhere. It's casting a shadow. And so I'm walking in a valley of darkness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. Because by God, you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come from When we get that revelation, we can walk in victory. When we get that revelation, we can walk on the water just like Peter did. We'll walk with a smile on our face. We'll walk without the worry because we know who we are and we know where we are. We're children of God and we are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The words that we read in the scriptures are not here so that we can read a good book. It's not for entertainment purposes. It's to be a revelation to us. This is a present reality thing. This is not something to look forward to in the future. I mean, there are some things we look forward to. We talked about it in the resurrection of the dead. But this is something for the here and now. Not something we get to experience and enjoy in the future. It only gets revealed in the future to everyone else. But it's something that's a reality now. The resurrection of the dead is in the future where we get clothed with that, 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 that clothing that God uh, has made for us with the, his robes of righteousness. Yes, that is coming. But this is the resurrection that gives life to our mortal body now because the life of Christ in us now is us spearing a taste of heaven. It's eternal life starting now, not later on. So let's look at some other scriptures to to consider. Colossians chapter 2. I forgot who last read. It was me? Okay. So Deborah, Colossians chapter 2. 11 through 14. 11, John 12, Monica 13, and Ralph 14. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having given, having forgiven you all trespasses. Mm-hmm. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, to his cross. Mm -hmm. He circumcised us with a circumcision not made with hands. That means it wasn't man doing it. He did it. Now in the Old Testament man would cut off the foreskin of the flesh. That was something done with hands. But God did something that could not be done by hands. It was not done by hands. It was done spiritually by what? His spirit. When you were baptized and you were raised, God did a circumcision without hands and that he circumcised what? Your heart. Your heart. Exactly. 
We were dead. But when he circumcised our heart, he did a new thing. He gave us a new heart. He gave us a new spirit, according to Ezekiel chapter 36. And then on top of that, he put his spirit within us to cause us to walk in his ways and guard his statutes and do them. That was the prophecy of Ezekiel 36. How did he raise us up the servant? By giving us his blessed Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, the blessing of Abraham, the gift of God. Why? So that we can walk in the Spirit. So that we could serve him alive now. Even though we are in this contaminated flesh. The handwriting of ordinances that we read about, that's referring to the law. But he took the law, and what did he do with it? He nailed it to his cross. So his body paid the penalty for our sins. He paid the price for us. He died so that we might live. We were dead, but he substituted our death with his death. And he gave us life. He did the work of salvation. And we receive that by simply obeying the gospel. That's repentance from dead works. Faith toward God. Baptized in the name of Jesus. And receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's obeying the gospel right there. So there really is no need for us to die any more for our sins. There isn't any reason for us to die day in and day out. God already took care of that when he bore our sins on the cross. We don't need to die again because we already died with Christ. When Paul said, and I'm going to refer back to this, when Paul said, I die daily, he was saying that he placed his life on the line every single day for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was whipped, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked, he was stoned to death and in peril by all manner of men. It wasn't because he was dying daily because of his sin. It wasn't that he was dying daily because he was so defeated because of the sin that run rampant in his life. Yeah, he struggled. You see, he was very honest and transparent when he wrote to the Romans. In Romans chapter 7, all you you see is Paul struggled, Paul struggled, Paul struggled. But you read chapter 8 and you realize Paul got the victory. Yeah, he struggled, but he got the victory. Paul lived above that. He had a revelation which God wants us to also have, to receive and to walk in. Rise above the old man because the old man is dead. He's buried. Walk in the newness of life that he's given you. Serve God with all your heart. Serve God without any baggage. Serve God without any burden of past deeds. And it doesn't matter if the deeds were done before you were born again or if the deeds were done after you were born again because he died for the sins of the whole world whether they were born again or not. It doesn't matter when it happened. He just wants you to repent and get back on your feet and serve him with your life which is his life. It says Christ suffered once and for all sins. He died in our place. He resolved the issue of sin in our lives. He suffered for our sins. The just, meaning him, suffered for the unjust, meaning us. But why did he do this? Because he was reconciling us to God. God was in Jesus and put to death in the flesh. But God didn't die. His flesh died. The body of Jesus Christ died. Absolutely no doubt about it. But I've told you before, your flesh is not who you are. Who you really are is your spirit inside. And the same with Jesus. The man Jesus, that's just how he expressed himself in the flesh and how he represented himself to be able to be visible. But God is invisible. 
God is above and beyond the flesh that he came in. And it went, when he said he gave up the ghost, he gave up his spirit. His spirit never died. So his humanity, what is common with us all, died. But even, even so, the body of Jesus was what? Quickened again. It was risen again on the third day by the Spirit of God. And in three days, the Spirit entered into him again and did something to the body, changed it, transformed it, made it alive, and we call it the quickening. So we have to realize that he suffered once, not twice, not three times, for our sins. For us who are born again, death is in the past. Baptism or burial is in the past. Resurrection in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost, that's also in the past. Because he already did the work. We obtained what he did for us by faith and obedience to the gospel. And all, what, all that we wait for now concerning the resurrection is what? The finished product. In the day of Christ Jesus, what will he do? He will perfect that which concerns him. We concern him. <laughs> we are his body. And he's concerned about bringing his body to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. But if we have our mind renewed by the word of God to what the word is saying, we will realize we don't have to sin. This is the resurrection life that we have and that we experience and that we can walk in now. But some of us think that we continue to think we inevitably must fail. We inevitably, oh, we must expect failure. That isn't true. Not if he's given you the resurrection life. It says that those who walk in the Spirit shall not what? Anybody remember? Will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh is contaminated with sin. It still desires to sin. It still wants to do whatever it wants to do and satisfy itself. But if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you walk in the Spirit, you will not sin. It's that simple, guys. But if you don't believe it and you just want to continue the old paradigm, well, I'm falling and that's just going to be my rationale, my justification, my reasoning, and my excuse if I should fall again. Then more than likely, you're going to fulfill your own prophecy. But it doesn't need to be that way. Yes, we have sinned, but we don't need to remain sinners which are people that actively do sin. So let's read 1 Peter 3.18. Let's consider that verse. Who's next? Anybody remember who last read? You did? No, Ralph. Oh, Ralph? Okay, so you have it. 1 Peter 3.18. And this just sort of repeats what I said in words. Um, as I was summarizing everything together, but it, this clearly says what, what, uh, what Peter declared. For Christ also hath one suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So you see the first several scriptures we read before? Who, who wrote those scriptures? Paul. Oh. Paul. Now we have Peter. And Peter basically echoed what Paul already wrote. Peter and Paul are saying the same thing because they never contradict each other because this is the Word of God. The Word of God does not contradict itself. Ephesians and Colossians state that we were dead and we were raised. Peter confirmed Jesus died but was quickened by the Spirit. So in like manner, we die once and then we're also quickened by the Spirit of God, which is why it's so important that you need to get the Spirit of God. You need to get the baptized in the Holy Ghost. You can't be made alive without it. Or I should say, without him. So let's consider 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 16. One verse at a time, and I guess I'll read 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, 
because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they should, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. For henceforth no be no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. So here we go back to Paul, writing the letter to the Corinthians. And he concludes that Jesus died once for all men. And since that is true, then we're all dead in him. But why? So that we should live in him. Not to ourselves, because if we live unto ourselves, then we're living according to the flesh. And the flesh is contaminated with sin. It does not produce good fruit when you walk in the flesh. So this is the finality of the whole question. We don't need to die daily anymore to our sin or to ourselves. We should consider ourselves dead because he died in our place. We are dead to sin. Let's read that again. Romans chapter 6, 2. I guess that's Monica and Ralph. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Right. Romans chapter 6, verse 2. And he'll read Romans chapter 6, verse 11. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We are dead to sin. That's a present now reality thing. We are dead to sin. And then verse 11. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know another word for reckon? Reckon yourselves. Anybody know? Reckon? Fix. Fix yourselves? So we could say fix yourself? What is reckon? Reckon yourselves dead to sin. Fix. Oh. I, I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> How about the word consider? Consider yourselves dead to sin. But what? Alive to? What did you read? Unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I'm alive to God through Jesus Christ who lives in me. Because I'm going to allow him to live his life through me. Like Paul declared, it is not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Some people don't realize this. He died in our place, so we don't need to die as he did to pay the penalty for our sin. Because some people walk that way. Some people, some people are so guilt-ridden. They have a hard time accepting the, the fact that Jesus paid for their sins. And so they keep beating themselves up. And beating themselves up because they feel like, well, I need to pay the penalty. No. No, you don't. You deserve it. But no, you don't. Because of his mercy and his great love toward us, You don't need to pay the penalty for sin. You don't need to get whipped. You don't need to get beaten. You don't need to get punished. You don't need to get disciplined. He paid the price for your sins. Stop beating yourselves up for it and walk in the newness of life. Previously, When we were dead, God called us dead in our trespasses and our sin. And the whole reason he died in our place was not so that we could die too. Because then what would be the point of him dying if we still needed to die for our sins? But the whole reason he died for our sins is so that we could live now in a contaminated flesh and still serve him. And live for him. He made an exchange. He bought us with a price. Now since you are bought with a price, live accordingly. Live unto righteousness. Live unto purity. Live unto holiness. Live unto the things that are pleasing to the Lord. So that your relationship with Him is not broken again. And you're not separated anymore. 
but live like you had, like like your relationship has been restored and reestablished. And the closer you walk with him, the less you want to do things that are displeasing to him. But some of us don't seek him. Some of us don't incline our hearts toward him. And and we've received it on a, on a level that's kind of superficial. It's not that deep, you know. And, and then so we, it's easy for us to get astray. It's easy for us to, to, to walk contrary to him. Why? Because we stop getting close to him. But the closer you press into him, the closer you, you seek him and, 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 and the more desire you have of him, the more likely you're not going to do things that are pleasing because you're going to develop a fear of the Lord that is healthy, that is pure, that is holy, that is true. And it's going to cause you to not want to walk in ways that are displeasing to him, but find the ways that are pleasing to him and walk in. So he died so we can live for him. So I don't know him according to the flesh. I don't know him according to his death. I know him according to the eternal living spirit that is living in me. That is causing me to walk in his ways. That is causing me to walk in his life. So let's together, there's going to be a bigger one, read John chapter 5, and we'll read two verses this time, at a time. John chapter 5. 18 through 30. And I forgot who last read. Do you anybody remember? Okay, so Ralph, John chapter 5, starting at verse 18. Huh? I did read last. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with Patricia. I'm not trying to get out of it. <laughs> oh, it's going to come back around. Okay. John chapter 5, starting at verse 18, we'll read two verses at a time. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also that God was his father making himself equal with God. Is that what you wanted? Two verses at a time. Oh, sorry. Then entered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, those also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son. And sheweth him all things that himself doeth. And he will shew him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. For that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in him himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and have given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, mm-hmm. and they have done evil unto the res- re- under the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father who has sent me. I hope that you see through those passages a lot of what I shared today. When God speaks to us, He accommodates Himself to our thoughts. He accommodates Himself to our language. For example, in Jonah 3.10, it says that God repented. Now, normally, when we think of the word repentant, we think, oh, he's sorry. Oh, he did something wrong. He's got to fix it. Right? 
But that's not what repentance means. If you've listened to any of the teachings that I've given over so many weeks and months and years, that's not repentance. God doesn't make mistakes that he needs to repent. Repent means simply to turn away, to change your mind. Now, we use that word repent as if you were doing something wrong to go do something right. But repentance only means change your mind or turn away. Turn for what you were doing and do something else. Not that it was wrong, not that it was right. You just change your mind. So how can God repent? He doesn't make mistakes. Why would he need to repent? So when it speaks to us that God repents, we understand that God turned from doing something that he had planned to do. He had planned to take out King Hezekiah. But what did King Hezekiah do? He began to sob. He began to cry. He began to seek the Lord. He began to ask for forgiveness. And and he repented. And then God, because of what he did and how he had changed, he said, I'm going to give you more years to your life. Did God make a mistake? No. But he was speaking to him. He was accommodating himself to his language saying, you're going to pay for that. (laughs) King Hezekiah, you were wrong. You're going to pay for that. But he repented of what he did. King Hezekiah repented and then God added years to his life. So in that same understanding, we understand that in God's infinite wisdom, he really didn't change his mind about anything. He just responded to things that were happening in the earth. And to us, it seems like he changed his mind, but he always knew what he was going to do. It's not like, it's not like he, knew, he knows exactly what he will do and when he will do it. There's nothing that happens on the earth that says, whoa, wait a second. God is like, ah, uh, I got to... No, he's just, re, he's just responding to what you're doing in the moment that you're doing it. But it's not like he didn't know what was going on or what was going to happen. He's already declared the end from the beginning. He's written it as it's going to happen. He didn't say, whoa, I'm going to erase it. Let me rewrite this story because I didn't didn't expect Jojo to do whatever he did. I didn't expect Mary to to say what she was going to say. I got to change this. No, he didn't change his mind in the middle of anything. I wasn't expecting this. In Exodus 3.8, God says, he came down to deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians. Well, what do we know about God? What do you mean he came down? God is omnipresent. What do you mean he came down? He's just accommodating himself to our language. Because where do we see God as? He's in heaven. But he's everywhere. He was was on earth the whole time. I mean, there's no place you can hide from him. The Psalms say that. I can go as high as the top of his mountain. I can go as low as low as high. I can go into the deep, 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 deep blue sea. And there you are. He's always there. He's everywhere. So he's just accommodating himself to our language. So here, and the reason why I'm talking about accommodating himself to our language is because what we just read, he was accommodating himself to our language because he says here that the Son of Man can do, or the Son can do nothing unless he sees the Father doing it. So he is showing that he himself was a man absolutely dependent upon God. That's what he was trying to show us because he was a walking example of what the children of God should be in their relationship with God. You should be seeing what the Father is doing and going to do it. You should be hearing what the Father is saying and going and repeating it and saying it. But it's not like he needed to. He was just accommodating himself to our language to help us understand because at that point, nobody understood. They, they, they might have, in a sense, accepted that he was the son of God. They might have accepted he was the son of man. But what did they refuse to accept? That he was God. No way. No way. You're God? No. You make yourself, you, that's blasphemy. No way. You know, they might, they might, chew on a little bit the Son of Man. They might chew on a little bit the Son of God, but they wouldn't have chewed on if he said right out, I'm God. But he did say it 
in, in other ways, and we've studied those before. I and my father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say it out explicitly, but he was trying to get there, but he knew they weren't going to receive it. So he's accommodating himself to our language when he says, whatever I see the father doing, that, that I do. Whatever I hear the father uh, saying, that is what I say. Because he's teaching us that man must be absolutely dependent upon God. So much so that he could not do anything unless he saw the Father doing it. Now this is subtly expressing who it was that was living through him. The Spirit of God himself. But reading Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, it explicitly states, you know what that means, like outright, without any any, any uh, hidden areas, it states, God was in Christ. What was he doing? Reconciling the world unto himself. That's explicitly stated. After he was dead and buried and risen again, that's what the scriptures explicitly stated. So this is what he's saying here, that the Father, the Spirit, was living his life through him. He was an example to us of how we should be dependent upon the Spirit of God. Now, Jesus raised up Lazarus from the dead. You remember that? And because he saw the Father doing it. Again, he's just accommodating himself to our thoughts, to our understanding, so that we understand the Father was in Jesus raising up Lazarus from the dead. That's why Lazarus awoke. Because the Father was raising him up from the dead. So when judgment comes, Jesus is going to be the only one on the throne and everyone is going to see that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. All will acknowledge that he was and is God. Now, God made this manifestation, what, what is termed the Son, the focal point of all ministry. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life to get to the Father. You can't get to the Father outside of Jesus Christ. You can't go around Jesus like, uh, I'm going to bypass him and just go walk around. Rock around. No, you, you miss him. You miss the entire point. You going around Jesus is like you jumping over the wall to get to the outer court. Remember the old, old, old tabernacle? What did he call someone that jumped over the wall to get in, that didn't go through the doorway? A thief and a robber. Why? Because he tried to bypass the door, the way. Jesus is the cornerstone laid in Zion. Who are the dead? The sinners. Those who are serving Satan. Those that are walking in the spirit of disobedience. And they that hear of the sinners, they'll live. That's what Jesus said. And those that hear shall live. The dead are those that are separated and apart from God, living after Satan. Jesus says, and now is. He didn't put that in the future. He said presently, and now is the time. That's why we're preaching the gospel. We're preaching the gospel to a bunch of what's very popular in movies and TVs now. Zombies. Mm. The walking dead. That's what we're doing. We're preaching the gospel to the walking dead. See if they'll be quickened and made alive by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The dead need to hear the voice of the Son of God. Jesus is preaching to others through us. So when the dead hear, they live because those that hear him become doers of the word. When we come to Jesus through his body, we can receive eternal life. So consider John chapter 6, 63. Oh, that's right. That was you, right? Okay, so John chapter 6, verse 63 says, Jesus said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Quickeneth means to give life. That's why when we preach the gospel, it's not us preaching, it's him preaching the gospel. And if it's his words that are being preached, then those words have the potential to bring forth life from the dead. 
The Holy Spirit in believers is what gives life because without the Spirit, we're still dead. He doesn't want you to stay dead. He doesn't want, he, excuse me, He wants to give you His Spirit. He wants to give you life. These words that we speak are seeds that are planted in the hearts of people. God causes them to sprout and bring forth at His perfect time. So Deborah, if you read Romans 4, 17, as we come near to the end, Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they, are, they were. He called forth the things that were not as though they were in the creation. We saw that in Genesis. He spoke things that were not. It means that they weren't there. There was no light, but he spoke it, and bam, there it was. All he needed to do was say the word. For those that are dead that hear, all they need to do is but obey, and they shall also live. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, Monica. Romans 8, 10 and 11. So you got that? You got the importance of that? If the Spirit of God is in you, the body is already dead because of sin. Because he already paid the penalty. The Spirit of life is or, or is because of what? Righteousness. Then read the next verse. 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. You see, the quickening is happening now in your what? Mortal bodies. It's now. And so that's why I added this to the resurrection of the dead because yes, there is a resurrection to look forward to, but you must realize that a resurrection quickening has already happened in you if you've been born again. To allow you to live a life of righteousness and purity and holiness and ways and acts and, and deeds and words that are pleasing to the Lord now. Christ, by His Spirit, which is also known as the Spirit of God, gives us life. So let me use a parable that Jesus spoke to show you how the growth of this life comes about. Mark chapter 4, 26 through 32. We'll read two verses at a time, starting with Ralph. Mark chapter 4, 26 through 32. Chapter 4, verse 26 through 32. And Two verses said, at a time. Sorry. And he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed unto the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. Now listen. The kingdom of, he's describing what is the kingdom of God like. And he's describing it, and we've looked at this before. The parable of the sower is another parable that talks about the seed. The seed is the kingdom of God. And he's spraying it everywhere, in all types of hearts, all, all, all different types of people. And he's now describing here, how does it grow? I mean, it, no one knows how it grows. They, they, they didn't have all the scientific knowledge that we have today. He's speaking to common people. They just knew that if they planted in the ground, the seed would then grow and you'd have this thing growing out. But they said, but he says, but they really don't know how. 
Next two verses. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of a mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and become greater than all earths, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So this verse, or verses, speak to us that revelation, the kingdom of God, is like a seed. The kingdom of God, the, the spirit, or any, any revelations that God gives us is like a seed that is sown into the heart. But notice, in both of these cases, it takes time for it to grow. The person who sows the seed, remember this is a parable, doesn't know how the seed is going to grow. Doesn't have all the scientific ins and outs of how the atoms get together and do all the things that it does in the, you know, the mononucleosis or whatever, or cells and membranes and all the things that happen. All he does is he sleeps at night and he, sleep, and he goes about his day. And all of a sudden, something just starts sprouting. We don't have to know how it's going to happen. We don't have to understand how in the world is Jesus going to bring this about. That's his business. That's what he does. So I pray that this resurrection now is planted as a revelation in your heart. You may not understand it all now, but it will grow. A little here, a little there. The seed must first die in the ground of the heart and then it will bring forth fruit in time. If we receive this revelation in our heart, then let, it, let us wait. Allow it to grow. But even farmers know, I, re I really, I mean, what's the best thing you could do to help it grow? Is to make sure that the ground is saturated with water. Making sure that you're keeping out the bugs, the locusts, or whatever is out there that, that could eat up the things as they start sprouting up, and just trying, to, just trying to keep it protected. But let God do His thing. And God is going to bring forth that blade, and then the ear, and then the full corn, and all of that. Let us cultivate this truth with faith. It says that the Old Testament saints did not receive the promises of God because they did not mix faith with the Word. And today, it happens the same way. Because we don't mix faith with the Word, we don't really see these things come to pass in our life. It's called unbelief. And unbelief still stops the promises of God from being manifested in our own lives. We have to mix faith with his word. So the idea of the resurrection is an overcoming life from sin. A life seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And it is likened unto the kingdom of God. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus said, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. This revelation is going to grow until it completely manifests for all people to see. That's the resurrection of the dead that's going to happen. They need to see that we are not just people that say we believe in Christ or a resurrected Christ. They need to see a living Christ in us right now. They need to see Christ living his life through us right now. They need to see us stand for truth. Stand for holiness. Stand for the commandments of God. 
amidst a crooked and perverse generation that says that those commandments are outdated, that those commandments are, 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 are foul, they're not right, and they start to disparage the Lord, they start to disparage things that He's done in the past because they don't understand it, because they're ignorant. And yet God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what He's decreed as sin in the past remains sin today. What he decreed as righteous in the past is righteous today. Woe unto them that declares that which is evil good and that which is good evil. Woe to them. This is something that if we allow God to do it in us, we can live a resurrected life now and attain the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Thus is the ministry of our Father's heart through us. Our utmost desire is to be in the Father's heart, to know the Father's heart, and express the Father's heart to you. If you appreciate listening to this podcast and were blessed, pass it along to a friend, an enemy, a co-worker, a stranger, by text, email, or word of mouth in the hopes that they might be positively impacted as you were. If you are interested in supporting our efforts, we would ask you to consider the following. One, pray for us. Two, leave a positive rating or review with whomever you listen to our podcast with. And three, if you so desire to contribute monetarily, you can do so at paypal.me slash jbenjesus. That's paypal.me forward slash jbenjesus. God bless.